She gave me a cookie and I ate it. I ate the fuck out of that cookie. You did eat that cookie. But you know what? I don't know what was in that cookie. Could have been anything. Could have been drugs. You are, you are looking a little weird to me, man. Diabetes? More weird than normal or? I think you just need a haircut. That's yeah, yeah. Did you always have an extra eyeball? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right in the... Right in the f- <laughs> It doesn't that's work what, though. Then yeah, that's why that's why I was always such a big fan of TN. <laughs> Said no one ever. <laughs> so, somehow your third eye's lazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it just like goes crooked to the side. Uh, let me just Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm doing it. Oh fuck. I feel like there's more ice in your cup than drink in your cup. I got that brown drink. Anytime it's brown drink, you know it's good. You but the, I you always drink brown stuff. It's my favorite color. <laughs> it's not. Could be. Brown's a good color depending on the shade of brown. Yeah. I like a good Hershey. Maybe a... <laughs> Go on. Maybe like a real smooth midnight Milky Way. <laughs> Maybe even like, you know, hit it up with a nice light caramel. But I don't like that like mixed with yellowish baby shit brown. That's, <laughs> that's not a good color. The super light. Super light light. Let me get my notes out. I think I wrote notes for this show. Let's see. Show uh, notes. Show notes. Believe it or not, we actually write notes for the... We usually don't no. write anything. Um, According to my notes, it says, record podcast, don't fuck it up. Oh, uh, <sighs> Yeah. We might have to start over. Burnt after now. Pew! Hey there, everybody. You are listening to the Drunken Pen Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Caleb James. With me, as always, Spencer, the Minnesota Mung Merchant. (laughs) Church. It's a good one. Yeah. That one I actually thought about before we got to the episode, and it's gross. If my definition of Mung is correct, it's disgusting. And the fact that you're selling that stuff, isn't that what it was on South Park, the episode where... uh, I think shit was one of the deadly words, and they kept saying it too much. So the, it was like the yeah. episode of A Thousand Shits. And then uh, Cartman said that Mung was the worst swear word ever, mm. and it was one of the deadly words. I think it was Mung. Maybe. Either way, it sounds disgusting. Yeah. Today, Dr. Phil couldn't make it. No. So I'm going to play the psychiatrist here as we get depressing. We couldn't get Steve Harvey either? <sighs> I mean, it's the same guy. Yeah. Mustache and all. Just, uh, I don't know, Steve Harvey hosting the feud and shit. I don't want to bother him. <laughs> naming, got, naming things wrong. Naming things wrong. Got fly-ass suits. I don't got time <laughs> to get all. Maybe I'll get D.L. Hughley. I don't think he's doing anything lately. No. No. We are talking about... Rejection. And what many writers experience... And I would say probably every writer experiences at some point the urge or the desire, not necessarily desire, I would say more of the uh, temptation temptation to just quit. I feel this from time to time, especially I, I find I definitely feel it when I'm hitting a patch of like bad productivity, when I'm not writing well. Like if I'm trying to force the words onto the page and it's not coming and it's like a solid week of that, I'm just like, why am I even fucking trying? Who's going to read anything I publish anyway? Yeah, well, I mean, that makes sense. You're not going to have those those thoughts and about quitting and stuff while you're... You're not going to be, like, busting out 3,000 words and just be like, you know why? Why? I should just stop. I should just give the fuck up. Well, there's the other side of the coin. You bust out the 3,000 words, but then maybe you struggle, depending what you're doing with them... Maybe you're struggling to get it published somewhere, yeah. or you, you're you just not getting readers to it. Maybe you published it to your personal site or something, and that can be very detrimental to your mental health. Yeah, that's like the, that's like the next level of it. There's also imposter syndrome, which I think even famous authors get. Even like well-published, kind of level see, Stephen King-style writers are just, they think, ah. Well, See, I'm I, a phony. I, I, see, I would think the more famous you'd get, the the higher and more um, strong that the the 
imposter uh, technique would, would could feel because you'd ha- you actually have people you're like oh this is just this is just a fluke they just like I wrote one good thing like a couple years ago and now people uh, they just they buy everything but they haven't realized it shit yet like yeah. just wait until they find out and then to like we talk about like how we feel that but it's even hard for like it's hard to feel have imposter that imposter feeling whenever you haven't even, even got a chance to do anything really yet to yeah. give you that feeling. Which almost made is like a, just another like little starting like salt into the wound like because you feel that and then you're like you you idiot you shouldn't even be feeling that you're not even worth that you feel below that, that feeling. Yeah. Um, I wonder if James Patterson feels imposter syndrome. I don't think he gives a shit. I don't think he cares either. I think he looks at his at his bank <clears throat> bank account and does not give a fuck. You brought up a good point. I think um, after your first book, if it does well. That's definitely a place where that can come up, and then maybe like I could imagine an Andy Weir. Yeah. He came out with The Martian, which exploded beyond I'm sure even his expectations, and then he came out with Artemis, which we both enjoyed, yeah. but a lot of people didn't think it was as good or didn't like it because it was more of a sci-fi versus The Martian, which was almost realistic. Yeah, like The Martian almost could have been a biography of somebody that lived on Mars, whereas Artemis is a. Uh, just a standard sci-fi kind of fun, you know, caper story. And I could see Andy Weir. I mean, if he didn't have like a scientist day job or whatever the yeah. fuck he does, I could imagine him being like, ah, maybe I'm not really, you know, a good writer or maybe people just, you know, I hit once and that was just a fluke. Like you said, yeah. that, that very well can happen. And I imagine you get, uh, you get more authors than you would suspect doing that. It's a shame, especially in his case, because like I said, I think if you just go on the merits of the book that it's really good, they just people are hating it on other reasons, which I know how probably has to happen to a lot of authors, is that the ridicule that they're getting isn't even for the actual work that they that they put out, it's for some other thing or or something to relate it to a different work or, or something like that. I think writing a sequel to something that was pop, not a sequel to like the book, but just your sequel novel yeah. when the first one did so well, that is like, just the pressure alone. I could imagine it would be daunting, especially if you get like a book deal and stuff beforehand. And his fucking first book got a movie. Like, yeah. A, like a major. Uh, got wo- Matt Damon to be. Matt in. fucking Damon. <laughs> I'm Matt Damon. <clears throat> Matt Damon. And it, uh, Probably won some awards and shit, I think. But that was a... I don't know, it was nominated for Oscars and stuff. It got a for a Golden Globe for, like, Best Comedy or something. Yeah. Something weird like that. But, I mean, who the fuck gets their first book made into a super popular movie? Directed by, like, a... Didn't really Scott direct it? I think so. It was, like, ridiculous. Or was, or was he the... Or he a producer? So he was involved. I think he directed it. Might be talking about my ass, but I'm pretty sure... That's that, what I thought, but... Regardless, I, he was involved. Yeah. But it was a... It was a really good movie, too. So, imposter syndrome is definitely real. And when you're the lower guys, such as ourselves, or if you're, you know, an unpublished author, it's very easy to quit before you even really get your foot in the door. Yeah. And uh, that kind of goes, you know, back to the whole rejection thing. Because I've, I don't submit too often. I probably submit a handful times a year. And usually it's like the same story to different publications. So it's not like I'm getting the work out there, but I have a 100% rejection rating. Yeah, but like, I said, like we were talking before we, we started that it you're better than I who haven't even submitted anything yet. So, which I'm sure once, you know, finally get around to going down that route, I'm sure I'll get my, you know, my fair share as everybody else. The thing that kicks you in the dick isn't the rejection. It's, it's that re- you wait like three or four months Minimum. I, I guess just for everything that I've heard about it, it'd be one thing like if you send it in and like a week later you found mm-hmm. out they wasn't interested or whatever. And you'd be like, okay, that's fine. But it's like months being like, what's going on? I've had things taken six months to a year before I got the rejection. And typically, especially if it's a bigger publication, you don't want to submit it, you know, shop it around to other yeah. places while it's there. Because what if you shop it to a low-end magazine that pays... I don't know, fucking a hundred bucks. Or just doesn't even have the eyes on it. Yeah, and maybe they, but maybe they accept it and you're like, oh, cool. And then, you know, your fucking piece for the New Yorker, like, hey, we were going to pick that up. It was like, oh, well, I just blew my big opportunity. Like, that Mm -hmm. sucks. So you don't want to do that. Like, when you get that rejection letter, what gets you is, if they're just like, it sucks, or they tell you what's wrong with it, that's fine. Or any kind of, you know, critiques or feedback, 
that's golden. But most of the time, you just get, oh, thank you for submitting. We feel that this, po- you know, your not piece wasn't. Not interested in it at the moment, but yeah, feel free to submit again. Yeah, and like what really always busts my balls is, you know, they tell you that it's just not a right fit for their magazine or something. So it's like, you know, fucking, yeah, okay, that's not helpful. Yeah. And then they do, do the whole, if you want to check out more of, you know, our magazine, though, and like fucking give you links at the bottom to, you know, buy their shitty magazine. It's like, no, I'm not gonna now. Yeah. I was only, the only reason I, was, I would ever read your shitty magazine is my story is published yeah. in it. And then you get all vengeful. <laughs> I'm gonna write you a strongly worded reply. Uh, that you will never read. That you won't read because you'll reject it right away. Yeah, but those generic rejection slips are the worst. It's like, at least if, you, like a Hunter S. Thompson, when he worked for Rolling Stones, he would send out these scathing rejection letters like you're the worst fucking writer ever go kill yourself but i would love that compared to just nothing well to just keep on with the 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 theme of of trying to put your work out there and just getting rejected so many times and if you should um you know even keep on trying just look at the story of superman that got rejected by every paper in the country multiple times like d even dc they they passed on it at least a couple times, and it was just sitting in a slush pile, and the editors picked it up, and they didn't have anything else to run, so they got a hold of them, and then fucking, that's history. That's like... Uh, imagine how good that would feel, though, once that did get picked up. Well, the same thing happened to J.K. Rowling. She uh, submitted Harry Potter to how many publishers, and they all rejected it for, it's too long, kids won't like it, all this shit, and then just kind of a fluke thing. When, I don't know if he was an agent, editor, whatever, he let his actual kid yeah. read the manuscript, and they loved it, and that's what got her foot in the door. And did you know they made her change her name? No. Because her name's, I think, Joanne, or John A, or something, and uh, Joan, maybe, I forget. Apologies, J.K. Rowling. But uh, she doesn't have a middle name. They just didn't think that people would buy a book written by a woman. <laughs> so they made her just add, now. go with initials, and she didn't have a middle name, so she just made up K. But it's like, it's kind of fucked up. Because that was still in the 90s. I mean, there was a lot of women writers, but I I don't know why they thought it wouldn't sell if it was written by a woman. If anything, like, that was kind of, like, a good chunk of, like, the, uh, that was, like, a new, like, a resurgence of, like, women in power kind of during the 90s, wasn't there? Yeah, but I think maybe it has to do with, like, if you look at the market at the time, the books that were dominating the kids' circuit were, like, Goosebumps, R.L. Stein, so... I can, you know, have the initials and, you know, ambiguous whether you're a man or woman. I I guess I can see from a marketing standpoint, but still stupid. Especially with, like, a 2019 lens. You're like, why the fuck would you do that? Yeah. It's Um, weird. But we talked about previously, and probably way too many times, what always kind of does inspire me, like, whenever I am feeling down about rejections, is Stephen King. In the fucking old days when you had to mail everything in, there was no internet or any kind of thing like that. You just had to mail shit in and he just had the stack on the wall that he, you know, tacked on just hundreds and hundreds of rejections. So it's like, okay, even, you know, the best of the best get that. I mean, I know you don't really le- read the, like the literary magazines, but you know, I've just showed you some stuff. Yeah. I'm sure you've seen this just even with online articles and stuff where you're like, how did something so shitty get published in like a mainstream yeah. book? And here I am. I mean, you don't, you know, you haven't submitted yet, but even so, like, if you were to get submitted and rejected, you'd have to be like, how does my story not stack up to that? Did they even fucking read it? That's what yeah. you always think. And I always wonder what, like, a main publication, like, what how big their slush pile is. And I guarantee you, most mainstream magazines do not read, read. beyond the first paragraph. Like, yeah. they might read it, because they have people yeah. they hired you know, just to read it. But they pro- if the first paragraph isn't good, or the second, you know, by the second paragraph, it doesn't pick up. Like, catch their interest, I guarantee they just dump it. Oh, because there's so much, yeah. Which you kind of have to do, because I've even had to skim things people submitted to us just because there was so much. Yeah. But I would always make the time to go back and give them the feedback or yeah. whatever I can do. But that, again, I'm not getting, you know, 5,000, 10,000 yeah. fucking submissions a week. If we did, we'd probably have to shut down the site. And just uh, uh, another part of that, too, that you're going to have to deal with as a writer, like you talked about, like... um the somebody else's work getting picked over yours even if you know you feel your work is better but even maybe if it's not you're still gonna feel that way whenever you like whenever if you submit to a magazine and you don't 
they don't take it and you read that next issue and see that all those stories and you're like, my story had to be better than these. Like it was, you know, maybe it was, maybe it's not. That's another thing you have to look at objectively as a writer and at, at your work and what you're putting out there. Another overlooked aspect of the whole submission game, when you submit to a magazine, I mean, often they will have a theme and even if you stick to the theme, um, it might not be exactly what they're looking for because a lot of magazines, what they do is um, they kind of put together like an overall theme. Um, not to sound redundant, but what I mean is like their stories are almost like stories inside a bigger story. Like they want their stories to kind of present a certain idea. So even if it you actually like, have... I, I think made the best way to kind of ex- is uh, explain it as kind of like, Look at a look at a season of like Black Mirror. They're yeah. all science, uh, like sci-fi tech, like based stories. Um, they're each separate contained, but they all deal with a different like element or part of a story. Or they whatever. kind of fit together like but, a puzzle. Yeah, and if you can make comparisons and and fit them together like that, that's why. Like with something like that, you're not going to get a random non-sci-fi western. Yeah. So if you even if it's a magazine that doesn't have a specific theme for that magazine, they still have a theme that they want for the magazine, even if it's not, you know, expressed. So you might submit, say, that Western story, and it might actually be something they would have accepted in a previous issue. Yeah. Maybe they had a spring issue and they were kind of going towards that. But in the newest issue, they're kind of going for a more modern take, so they want modern stories. And you would have no idea, and a lot of times these fucks won't tell you that when they give yeah. you the rejection letter. They just say, it's not the right fit for us right now or something. And it's really hard well, as a writer to kind of decipher what you did wrong. And that's when you'd know if they actually read it, because if they read it, they'd be like, this doesn't fit for this month's magazine, but maybe submit it again in a couple months. we doing another thing that it might be, mm. you know, again, give you a chance to polish it up a little bit more, and then resubmit well that too and then if they say it doesn't fit and then you pick up that magazine and three of the five stories in it are westerns yeah like, mm, i don't know man there's a cowboy on <laughs> the cover i feel like it fucking fit i feel like i had the right idea maybe it just wasn't a good story but here's another one which i wish i would experience which i might if i actually submitted more is if you uh which i'm gonna tell you something sneaky i've been doing but <laughs> i'll get there in a minute okay um okay. what i would like is like you get you especially if it's like a shittier magazine, submit to a lower end magazine and they reject it and you're like, oh, but then like the next day, the other magazine, which was better. Yeah. Sends you the exception. You're like, wah, 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 wah. I'm better than you. Your magazine sucks. My magazine's cool. But no, what have I, I've been doing, I've got a good workaround. Okay. I suggest everybody do it. No, I've been publishing a story, you know, I mean, I've only done this actually once, <laughs> but I'm going to do it more. <laughs> you know, I'm going to do it so much more. Look, these publications have trouble reading all these manuscripts and yeah. submissions and everything, right? Hold on, let's wait for her to get done jingling. Go ahead. She was Smash trying. it. She was Break trying. It. You should have saw her. It took her like five minutes to get into the room like a little bit ago. Yeah, I know. I've seen her creeping. I credit. God. Hey, it's all right. You're taking him out. There he goes. shaking his ass. Thanks for asking me. She's taking her walk, so listen here. Yeah, Ashley's a dog. It's yeah. pretty impressive. I think somebody had too many cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Extra chocolate fudge chunks. See you later. Hey, can you shut that door too? Oh, outside ruckus. Thank you. Open it up, well, you're gonna make noise anyway. The outside. Just get out of here. Just get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Don't bitch. Just get out of here. Just talk shit when she's out here. Just get out of here. That could make it sound, I can make it sound like I'm a hard ass. That's right, bitch. Get the fuck out of here. And she's already long gone. And then we get to cut it out and that'd be the actual episode she listens to. You fucking piece of shit. I'm gonna go sleep in the bathtub again. <laughs> no, you sleep in the basement, but it stinks down there. Anyway, I was talking about something. Yeah, I can't remember. You might want to record it back up for a sec. <laughs> um, I was talking about magazines. Well, what, and you, I, you, what you, sneaky you, thing I'm you, doing. The sneaky thing you're doing. You didn't get into it. But I had something else on that. It was a good topic and... Um, I just remember you just getting ready to get into the sneaky thing. Sneaky, sneaky. Well, I've only done this once so far, but like I said, I'm going to do it a bunch now. Oh, that's what it was. These magazines, you know, they're not reading 
you know, the full stories most yeah. of the time anyway. So that means they're probably not looking up these stories to see if they're published anywhere. Yeah. It's probably very unlikely. Maybe if they finally accept it, they'll look it up. But what I've been doing, or I'm going to start doing, publishing a story on DPW and then still submitting that fucker somewhere else yeah. by a different name. Oh, a different uh, name. Well, just a different title. You know, that's okay. it. The same story. See if these motherfuckers ever pay attention. And then maybe if they, and if they accept it, just take it off the site. That's all. Yeah. And. But then what would you. Well, here's what I could do too. I can just make it private while it's in the submissions, you know, while it's yeah. in the, while they're, you know, waiting to look at it. I could just have it private on the site. So even if they did look for it, they won't be able to find it. And as soon yeah. as I get that rejection letter, snap, it's back online. Yeah. Everybody can read it. The only thing I can see that maybe screwing you is like if you like the first name of the story better than the second title, and then you couldn't switch because you already had it like submitted under the second title. Eh, I don't care. But I think that's good workaround. Yeah. Especially if you have a blog or something, you can make it private. So while it's in the cur- query process, you can just have that shit private. And then if they reject it, back up. If not, they accept it. Just leave it private. Yeah. Nobody has to know that you were double dipping. Getting people to read a story that's getting published elsewhere. Of course, that's kind of a stupid role anyway. I mean, I get you don't want, like, you know, you don't want to accept something. Because we do that, too. We don't want to accept something that's published in another magazine because yeah. there's legal rights. Like, yeah. that'll fuck you. But on somebody's personal blog or personal website, I don't see why it fucking matters. Yeah. I mean, as long as there's they don't have any uh, copyright issues or anything, it's fucking who cares? There's no license problem, licensing problems. Anyway. All oh, that's above my pay grade. Above my pay grade. I will say this about rejection. At some point, you do kind of stop caring because you expect it. Yeah. I don't know if that just makes you pessimist, like a pessimistic asshole or you're just depressed. But at some point, you do grow a thicker skin. But when that first starts happening, you get real jazzed up, especially your first submission. Yeah. So excited. Real jazzed up. And more than likely, that story, unless you submit to a real shit publication, it's probably not going to get published anywhere. Yeah. Because it's probably not that good. Or even if it's that good, it's just, you have no name. It's hard. Like, I feel like once you get a name, or at least you can say, hey, I've been publishing this, this, and this, they will take your, you know, story more seriously. That's why you can get a James Patterson publishing, like, a short story in The New Yorker that's complete dog shit. Yeah. He has a name. And uh, I would love to be able to be that guy who just got a name and then could publish oh. fucking nonsense oh. and drivel. Or, like, why he's able to do, like, five books at a time because he's co-writing with, like... With somebody else in each book who's actually probably doing, doing the real writing, doing, doing the doing the legwork on everything, and they just he gets the top billing on the book, and the you know, and that's what sells it, I guess. Yeah, but diverting a little bit from the whole rejection aspect because that's enough to. It's the same thing with like actors. You get rejected from a, you know so many roles and stuff. You just feel kind of shitty about your stuff, yourself, and your abilities. But I want to go even below the rejection All right. before you even get to that point. When, especially when you're just starting out, or like how we are, where we're pretty established in what we do, but we still haven't hit the, you know, publishing market or even self-publishing yeah. market, and you just don't have enough work out there. And like us, we get sporadic audience, so we might get, you know, a certain amount of views and people reading our story, but usually it's not the same people that read you know whatever we previously published it's not like the same we just get kind of a smattering of people so i feel like that kind of uh can get you a little down in the dumps because you're not getting a you know significant audience and and like as you were just saying we're in this weird kind of transition and what we're trying to do other than like how before we'd have a, a whole bunch of like articles and reviews and flash fictions and now we're each trying to bit work on larger works of of fiction, like sh- like at least like decent ch- chunky short short stories. So like, not only do those take longer to do, which makes it longer to go out there, which is a bigger gap between getting any feedback from anybody, right. and then also with you talking about with the audience, like. It would probably be easier for us to keep a steady stream of audience when we were just putting a whole bunch out of, of that little stuff out, you know, other than taking like a month and a half to put something on the website because it's like a good like 
eight, nine thousand type like uh you know short story that we just finished or something like that. See, here is the this is the real predicament. Our views I don't think have ever been higher. Like we break, you know, every month is way higher than like thousands and thousands of more views than the previous year's month, you know, at the same yeah. time. But we're not putting up as much content because like you said, we're actually working on other stuff. But if we like when I do post a story on the site, it gets way more views than they used to for the most part, and I get more feedback, but it's kind of sporadic. So it's like if we focused on the website and just publishing stories through there, you know, we're weekly, not, like the flash we're fiction. Hurting, we're hurting our actual. Yeah, we would for- get that, we would have that audience, and we might actually build that uh, steady, you know, the steady readers who enjoy our work, which is what you want, not just sporadic readers. You want people that come back. They read your previous work and are reading your future work and the work in between. But we. Like you said, we're in that weird spot. It's like, well, we want to do bigger things. And then, you know, we got the podcast. Who's been, it's been doing great. But with the podcast, your- that's more time away from creating stuff for the site. But the, I feel the podcast helps with – helps fill the content um, gap that we're leaving with trying to do that other work. I, I feel like this here, considering how we – too, a lot of times we can do like one or two episodes a week. Mm-hmm. I feel like – like, okay, we're not – Maybe putting, writing as much stuff for the website, but, you know, that's at least a couple hours a week. Well, it definitely still, it brings in the audience, which is good. My only problem with that is it's a different audience. Yeah. I mean, we still have our fans that read our work that also listen to the podcast, but a lot of the people who might not be interested in actually reading our work, but like the podcast, will follow the podcast. So that's a... It doesn't benefit our writing necessarily, but at the same time, like this is a great platform we're building up because when we do come out with actual collections of short stories or novels, we already have this, you know, to promote it and people will read it from there. So that's a good thing. Yes. Hopefully. Um, Yeah. So we're just at that. I feel like we're on that, that weird line, that cusp of once we get over this last hump and get, you know, some stuff published and, and I feel like things will be a lot easier and we might actually break into that little – that higher echelons that we yeah. always looked at. Like, man, yeah. that's almost impossible to like, get see, to. It's like Super Saiyan 1. Yeah. Self-publishing is Super Saiyan 1. <laughs> <laughs> self-publishing quality work. Yeah. Not – because we could have self-published when we first started. Yeah. That doesn't mean it would have been yeah. good. Yeah. It, it, we could even sold when we first fucking published. But again, um, which is – I think is a good um indication of how serious we do take the writing though is – we don't want to just put out work to put it out. Yeah. Because we could easily write a shitty flash fiction every week for the site, you know, or or even like we did before where it might not be the best stories, but they're cool ideas. So we just type them up real quick. And we did that like three times a week. And then yeah. we would shit out an article and things like that. And while that has an audience, I would rather put out a solid fucking story that people really like, even if it was only once a month. Yeah. And then like, like, uh, with my, even like with my reviews, I like, um, because I've actually got a chance, I've, I've I've read some stuff that I've been wanting to review. So here, hopefully, here, like in the next um, couple of weeks or so, you, there should be more of that for the people who enjoy that. But like now, I'm really saving those for like things that I really want to highlight. Yeah, some like a uh, cool creator that I've met at a, at a convention. Or something like, you know, something along. Not necessarily just any random Joe Schmo yeah, that just, would send us something. Or just even like whenever we first started, I was just I was just reviewing random issues. Flash, yeah. Yeah, just whatever was on my pool list that week and, and stuff like that. Just again, because we at that point we were just trying to get a whole bunch of stuff yeah. to just so people could read it. Well, so, when we started DPW, it was more of just an avenue to do two things. One promote again the story collection that we didn't fucking write yeah and two to um well i guess three things two to kind of build an audience and three to practice our writing yeah and, because and it held us accountable because it wasn't just anybody yeah, could just I, get on their computer and write and write but to actually have the work people are going to read that yeah. hold that makes you a little more uh tight in your yeah, writing that's against that was, i was going to add on to that is the account of the accountability of like uh, if we're going to spend the money and do the website and then things like that, we better go and do it proper. That's another reason why it took so long to get the podcast up and running is because I didn't want, not that I'm a perfectionist, and by no means this podcast is perfect, 
but I don't want to put out subpar quality. Yeah, and like we've we listen to a lot of podcasts, and yeah. some podcasts are better. You know, we, we know what at least makes for an entertaining and you know decent sounding podcast. So again, even though we're kind of limited with our space and our recording setup. We still made sure we got a decent equipment. Like, we want to at least be mid-range with yeah. equipment and stuff, so we're not sounding tinny and aw- real awful. And again, we had to learn how to use all this shit, because neither of us knew shit about nope. audio. I was not I was never in a band or yeah. anything. And we're still learning. We're trying to... I think we're coming a good goddamn hope, ways, though. We keep, we keep on saying here, hopefully we can start... Get, we're trying to figure out the Skype or whatever delivery system we're going to use. And hopefully we can try to start getting some other different creators and guests on here. That also help, you know. And again, moving on up. One thing I did want to point out with the viewer, with trying to stay with the viewers on the on the website, is that I also want to let the people who uh, who might listen, who submit work into us that that we publish. I just want to take a second and thank you guys. You make you you relieve a lot of pressure within that regard. Oh, that definitely helps. And. So we just want to, you know, I, I just want to, you, you know, you guys might be feeling that blues about, you know, your your own writing stuff. So I just want to let you know that we here at DPW uh, really appreciate you guys submitting work, good quality work. So we have stuff to put onto the site to, so people can read and stuff. I actually did a call out today on if you saw for uh, writers and I already got a couple. Nice. Couple yeah. I, things I, coming I, in. I saw on the social media is that. Uh, you, you know, posting a link and stuff to get a, get a hold of us, but yeah, because we um we usually do the Halloween submission period, and, and that, that normally does, works. That's normally well, gangbusters. Yeah, that one is uh, almost more than I can handle. Like both of us, like yeah. reading stuff and you know editing and all that shit. Like that's usually a pretty good one. The winter one, we just it just doesn't happen. I think people are too busy, and uh, like I said before, our um readership falls off in the like around January to March. It usually kind of craps out. It doesn't. It's not bad, but it's definitely not no, like what it normally is. Which you'd think during like the winter time, you think, well, what else are people doing? Like, I think they're hungover from the holidays, honestly. Uh, maybe. And then, um, and then like spring's kind of hit or miss, and we don't do a summer one. Oh, you um, know what it is? It's probably like all the shows and shit are on during winter. Probably. I, well, I think just in general, there's less readers at that time. I think it's because I feel like everybody kind of has that pinch. But um, what are you doing now? Yeah, go ahead, pump that shit. That's not loud at all. <laughs> Just a waterfall. No Tupperware? It's a glass. It's actual glass. But yeah, you know what? You actually brought up a good point there, too. For anybody who is feeling kind of down in the dumps about their writing... You might not, you just might not be sending to the right magazines or publications. Yeah. Because again, like one thing we pride ourselves on is people send us stuff, even if we don't accept it, we'll at least actually give you feedback and let you yeah. know we read it. We're not just going to be, you know, this R is not a good fit, unless you're kind of a douche. Yeah. I've had a couple people who just, they didn't follow our guidelines at all. They just kind of came in like they were, you know, king shit. I'm like, sorry, but your shit is not a fit for us yeah. because you're a fucking cunt flap. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it, it's interesting too because now that I'm on the other side of the publishing industry, kind of, yeah. I can see exactly why somebody would just send those random just letters, yeah. just to yeah, just the rejection letters, the real generic ones, and why you might not read people's work fully. Because I've gotten things where I've read like the first couple paragraphs, and I'm like, this isn't very good, and I don't even if it gets better, I don't. If you don't have a strong intro. If I publish it on DPW, the readers might feel the same. They'll read the first couple paragraphs. They might not be into it, and they'll just kind of dump it. Yeah. And then you – but I'll at least tell that person, hey, you know, maybe rework this beginning or, you know, hey, I have to have some kind of stronger prose here. I can't just – you know, I can't, I can't bring in readership with subpar writing because that will also affect everything else on the site. Yeah. If they see we have a featured story – and then they read that story and it's not good, or at least the you know beginning's not good. They might think either a, the rest of the stuff on the site is that you know same, same level, quality. and that our reputation goes down, or b, well shit, they'll publish anything. I'll I'll fucking yeah. send some shit their way. I'm not even a writer, so <laughs> you don't want to go that route. You got to you still have to be kind of a dick sometimes, but you have to you have to be a kind dick. 
Dickish. You dickish. have to have dickish qualities. You have to be a lovable dick. Oh, lovable dick. J. Jonah Jameson? No. <laughs> yeah. Not quite. You don't have to be yelling at Spider-Man all the time. <laughs> Not a menace. Uh, you know what's crazy now? In the comics, he knows. Jameson knows. Finally? Yeah. He he was doing like an interview with Spider-Man. And like he was just talking because like, they, they had him go through some shit the past couple of years. Like his, his, one of his wife's died and just a whole bunch of stuff. And he's all depressed and, and, and stuff now. So like... He took off his mask and was like, hey, it's me, Peter. Like, I'm sorry. Like, oh, because Jonah's dad for the past couple of years was married to Aunt May. Oh, sexy. Yeah. And then so, like, he got killed recently, too, and, and stuff like that. So, like, to try to, um, you know, to help him get into better mood, he let him know that he was, spy- you know, that he was Spider-Man. And, you know, that he was there for him and, and, and stuff like that. And now, like, he's, like, stuck up his ass and, like, yeah. always trying to help him and cause him more, more <laughs> harm than good, you know, in, in the fights and stuff like that, but... Nice. Well, to go back to the topic at hand, what are your feelings on somebody... Like, what would you tell a writer, say, somebody that's been in the game for eight years, mild success in publishing, but it doesn't seem like they're ever going to get a real break? What would you tell them if they decide they were thinking about hanging it up? Well, I would have it would it it's a case by case basis because it has to depend on like, you know, if I've read if it's like one of those where like I've read their stuff and I think it's a good quality of work, mm-hmm. you know, I would, you know, you you tell them to, you know, you have to you keep on sticking with it if you can. Like if you're financially able to do it, like you know. Yeah, if, that's if, another obstacle. If, if there's something with work and you feel like it's just it, it's interfering with your actual work and stuff, and then you might have to for that. You know, you have to make sure you take care of your family and your and and, and yourself first. You know, but financially, if you're able to um to continue to do it, especially with the way things are nowadays because there's authors out there that are making a living off of writing and it's all more like self published or like lower you know lower publishing houses that you don't get this great big deal but like you're still getting money it's getting money and with it being more on a like if you're self publishing it and it catches fire you know even mild success you get a bigger cut of that pie than it you know so there's different ways. It's weird how it, like, it kind of, writing kind of mirrors, like, I know you're talking about, like, music, but I always think of just, like, rapping. I don't, I, yeah. maybe, maybe that's just because my, if there's a genre of music that I listen to more, probably, it would probably be rap. rap. So, but, like, of just being able to make a name for yourself uh, is, is a lot more easier now than, than what it would be. In the be. past, yeah. yeah. Um, what I would have to say, I think you kind of have to think about why you started writing in the first place. Yeah. And kind of reevaluate where you are now and ma- are you writing what's making you happy? Because if, you, if you're still enjoying the writing and the writing process, I say definitely don't quit. Yeah. If you're only writing to get published or to get notoriety you or to, to get money, money yeah. you're in it for the wrong, like, it's not the game to be in. That's very rare that that happens, and even if it does, it doesn't mean you it's... still have to be extremely talented at it. You'd have to yeah. be like one of those like, like at birth you could just write a screenplay, and you know one of those kind of cats that it just comes to them naturally. Not to, you know that you have to put in fifteen hours a day, or you know every couple of days to really hone on to the, you know making your book or whatever it is you're working on. You know what? I'm gonna go ahead and tell. Uh... Stephanie Meyer and E.L. James that. <laughs> Go tell him, hey, you have to be super talented to be fucking rich right, and famous right. in writing. I didn't know if you knew that or not, but so you... So, I don't you, know how you did it, but you gotta go back and give so that money away. Yeah, you gotta have to... You, it's like reparations. You have to give all that money back to struggling writers that actually are... That, that have some talent that are trying to make a name for themselves. <laughs> you stole their views, you bitch. Yeah. You fucking bitch. <laughs> He uh, stole all the stars. <laughs> all of them. Uh, man, I lost what I was thinking now because I got Don Stephanie Meyer again. It's a uh, it's a rough game though. So, do you want to talk at all like anything of uh, like what you like your output recently or where you've been? Well, which is kind of brought on 
this yeah, whole I, topic. Yeah, I know. So I, well, I think when I got back from vacation, I already, you know, I didn't write for a week doing that. And then I was kind of not in the writing mode, but I was doing other stuff, podcasts and shit, so I was fine. But then I got uh, one story I submitted, got rejected, surprise, surprise. And I was like, meh, this one took so long that I was kind of figured it was anyway. But then it, it got to the point, though, where they were reviewing it so long that I was thinking, well, maybe it's because they like it and they're decide. Yeah. And then I got the generic feedback, and I'm like, or the, you know, generic letter. And I was like, ah, fuck it. And, uh, but that that really didn't do too much in the whole depression department. I was uh, struggling there to write for a little bit, like a couple of weeks, and my output just hasn't been too good. And I the last couple of days, I finally just made myself write, even if it's just a little bit, and that's working a little bit. And I knocked out like a story and stuff the one like a week or so ago. So I still kind of put in out, but I've definitely been kind of getting that feeling of why am I even doing this? Like, who's going to read it? What's the point? And I usually go through, for me, about three times a year, I go through that phase. Yeah. No real reason, just like, even if it's, even uh, I've gone through that phase when... Stuff was going good. Yeah, people were reading my stuff, I was productive, and I still get that, why Why am I doing this? Though? Usually that also kind of coincides with, uh, I see like, you know, a fucking E.L. James comes off the new book mm-hmm. and it sells 50 million copies, or, you know, I read... Two things, you know, a shitty writer or a bunch of shitty writers getting published and doing very well. And I'm like, uh, or maybe I'll read something from a writer and it's just, especially if it's like a lesser known writer or one that's not famous at all, maybe hasn't even published either. And it's just like so fucking fantastic. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh God, there's a guy like this out there. Why am I even trying Like, that's a hard one to... Obviously, muster. this guy's going to sell all the books later on, so he why should, should I even attempt it? And if he's not selling anything, then what am I doing? What yeah. chance do I yeah, have? Yeah, if he can't get picked up by anybody, what what chance do I have? Yeah, so there, those thoughts do come around, but at the same time, the market doesn't give a shit about talent for the most part. No. It gives a shit about if you could tell a good story, and more importantly to the market, if you could be commercially viable, Yeah. if you can bring something that people are going to enjoy it could be dog shit story doesn't even have to be good if people buy it yeah that's what the market you know cares about and that includes the readers as the whole mumble rap industry has shown (laughs) us you don't have to be talented to sell you just have to uh you hit that fucking that line somehow maybe a hint of luck maybe you're because i'm sure a lot of those guys have probably been very consistent though like those mumble rapper guys we make fun of so much, I'm sure they put out fucking constant work and they're always doing stuff. So even if it's shitty, there's an audience for it. I yeah. mean, if we decided to, we could probably write really terrible, like... Romance stories? M- romance stories or like uh, satire erotica or something. That yeah. probably... We'll probably do very well if we really put our everything into it. Yeah. That's kind of what, like we were talking about earlier, the problem seems to be is we are... Almost like we have too many eggs, you know, in too many baskets here. Yeah. Like, we have our eggs in too many baskets because, you know, we're doing the podcast. We're trying to work on our collection. I'm writing my own short story collection. You know, we got sometimes we still want to get stuff for the site. It's like, it's a lot. And I feel like if only thing you were doing was just writing, that's the only thing you paid attention to. And you didn't have a podcast, didn't have anything else. It probably, you'd be more productive and you'd probably get a lot more work done. Or... Or you might get more sick of it. You might get burnt out faster. Matter of fact, before we started the website, I got burnt out a lot. And I probably, I'd do huge chunks of writing, but then I might not write for months. Yeah, you just get it all out there, one big spell. and. So that's that's not very good either, I don't think. Um, what about you? How's your output been? Our, well, the past couple of weeks haven't been great. But since this um, this weekend... So, um, this uh, Saturday we went to a convention. I'm wearing the shirt. Yeah, that's a very nice shirt. I'm wearing the nice shirt that we got that we got there. Um, so I had the weekend off for the convention. We only went Saturday, but that Sunday, I wrote probably somewhere within the six to eight hundred word range with finishing that uh, that uh, tech happy story uh, flash fiction piece mm-hmm. that we that we just recently published. And then working on my newest short story. And then Monday, I didn't get home until like almost 8 o'clock from work. So after getting like something to eat and cleaned up, I only was able to like throw like another like 
two hundred on top of that. I just I tried, but at least you did something. Yeah, though. I, I tried, and it was just like I was sitting there and just like I can't just just slide the, the, the laptop off my lap and just I can't right now. And then yesterday I was able to do I was able to work a, a co another couple hundred in. Yesterday was like a big like kind of like uh, Aaron Renan like I, I yeah. did like a, a lot. I went and saw the um, X Men Doc Phoenix. Poopy. Not as poopy as everybody's <laughs> saying. It's not as shitty as everybody's saying it is, but it's like within like the middle of the X Men movies. Like you didn't wipe your ass good enough, yeah. but it's kind of it's, technically clean. It it's better than like um, Last Stand and Wolverine mm. Origins and like that kind of stuff, but not as good as like. X2 or Days of Future Past, First Class, like that kind of stuff. So you wiped your ass, but even though there's no visible poop, it still smells. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, and then after that, I went to the bookstore afterwards because I was like, well, I just finished, you know, Fear and Loathing that we're going to hopefully begin to hear soon. And then I finally finished like the last two short stories that was in the, the, the Stephen King collection that I was working on. Um, so I was like, I should probably go and try to find something else. Like, you know, I have a couple of other Stephen King books I gotta get to, but you know, something Yeah, else. ignore your huge pile yeah. to read. Just... Yeah, or, or, or all the trades that I have. Yeah, ignore all that shit. Go buy something new <laughs> need, and shiny. I, I needed something different. <laughs> so I picked up Neil Gaiman's, uh, Good Omens. Ooh. Um. I'll have to borrow that when you're done. Yeah. Cause I was really, I was, cause I've told you before, they have like, they have like a collection of like, I think it's the four books that you have in your, yeah. but instead of like, it's not in one whole collection, they just have them like. Separated. Yeah, separated, but it's the same story. So like. A box set. Yeah, like a box set. So like, they had that for like 30 and like this for like 17. I was like, I'll just, I'll just get good omens now. Cause I only need one new book right now. I don't need yeah. like four new books. <laughs> um, so like, that's going to be on the, uh, you know in the batter box somewhere here soon. And then today I, before work, I did probably about like another like four or 500 words. So I got like Sweet. almost like a thousand, thousand five hundred in the, since like Sunday. That's not bad. You brought up a good point again. So you're on fire today. Spencer. Yeah. You didn't even mean to. No, I, I don't even know what the point is. It's that, uh, you know, we're talking about kind of feeling depressed with your writing and stuff. I think a lot of that ha- just ha- happens because of real life. Yeah. Work. Things like that. Because I think what gets me is work. A lot of times when I'm least productive is when I'm most productive at work, but not in a good way. Like, I'm just fucking exhausted all the time. So, if you have a day job or if you have kids or the combination, that burnout is real. You're burning the wicked, but, you know, the candle at both ends. So, you can definitely get burnout and not want to do any writing or even... Anything enjoyable is like, I don't know if you've had this happen where you come home and you can't even watch a movie. Yeah. You can't no, do like, anything. Yeah, no, I literally just like lay in the couch and like, not even like I'm out facing the room in the couch. Like I'm in, I'm rolled into in the-, the couch, <laughs> like with a blanket. <laughs> just not just into the crevice. Yeah. <laughs> you could be just part of the couch. Nobody would know. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, I made it a point with, um, knowing that I was having extra days off this week with, uh, uh, we're using vacation for the convention. I no one having those extra days. I wanted to make a point of trying to get a decent chunk of writing done. A because I haven't been doing anything for the past couple of weeks, and hoping that now, like tomorrow, I'm working an early shift. Like I get done at two. Like I gotta get up at five. Like you know, I gotta be at work at five in the morning, but I get done at two. So, like hopefully the that will give me enough time. I can. Get home, get cleaned up, grab something to eat, you know, maybe even take like a half an hour, hour, like power nap or something yeah. like, you know, and still have plenty of time in the day to put a couple hundred words out. One thing that kind of depresses me, like we went to the, you know, convention on Saturday, usually when I am in a little bit of a funk, when I go to things like that, I talk to creators or see creators, look at people's work. That usually gives me a spark to want to do my own stuff. I don't think that one gave you this this, this week. This con, I mean, I don't want to say it sucked, but there was really nothing there. It would have been fine if we lived the, it took place in Altoona, Pennsylvania, so that's a little bit of it's like a three hours almost drive for where we're at. So, like, I'm sure if we like lived there around there, and it you know it wouldn't have been a great convention. Yeah, if we it, just had to go 15 minutes down the road and went to a con, and it wasn't great, no big deal. Yeah, but the fact you drive that far, so that, that literally was our whole day. Yeah, couldn't do anything else after that. I got home, I was too tired to write, 
And it was like a glorified flea market this year. Yeah. It was mostly just junk vendors. And I hate that because I was kind of, I always look forward to going to that different conventions. Been, yeah, that one's been a good one. Yeah, and I always look forward to going to conventions because, like I said, I usually meet creators and stuff. And even with the Three Rivers, you know, talking to Dirt Manning and stuff got Three, me a little sparked up. Three Rivers was a good one. Yeah, I think in that, I, I don't think with how good Three Rivers was, I think also kind of dampled. Or, the Altoona or, one, yeah. Yeah, or like um, uh, amplified like the negative qualities of, of the Altoona. And then Three Rivers is a lot closer to us, too. It's like, about 30 minutes, 40 yeah. minutes away. Yeah, just seeing like, uh, you know, we were talking to Dirk Manning for a while, and he talked about, uh, you know, he's just showing us all his books and, you know, talking to us about random shit, but he's done so much writing. And then, you know, we listened to the panel he was in, and he's talking about not writing every day. Yeah. Because, you know, we go up to Stephen King, you should write your professional rights every day whether you want to or not. But then when you see another professional in his field say, hey, I don't write like that. I write – because that's how I write. Yeah. I try to write every day. It doesn't seem to work. But I can write huge chunks when I'm feeling it. Well, I he just uh, he just posted a picture a couple of days ago with like uh, the f- uh, issue – it was issue one of Hope. But like it was a, it was a picture of him after – Three days locking himself in his room. Yeah, it's all disheveled looking. Yeah, finishing the last the last issue of that series, and like sometimes that's what that's what you'll have to do. You might not be able to really do anything for like three or four days out of the week, but then you have those days off, and maybe that's see that's what my you... problem. If I could just get like a three or four days where I don't have to do anything, you know, no other responsibilities, it would be, it'd be fucking amazing. But at the same time. Would I just end up fucking doing nothing? Yeah. Because <laughs> I've done that before, playing my phone too much. That damn phone, too, like YouTube and yeah. shit like that. That's a, that's a real time. At least I don't get into, like, the Twitter writing community too much because I was trying to for a while, and I realized you take so much time yeah. and you're not getting anything out of it. Well, like, you just now because, like, how we were just talking about, like, people making names for themselves. Like, there was a guy on YouTube that I, like, um, that I follow – uh, I don't like follow him, but I I, check, I always check out his stuff. He is um, he does a lot of Dragon Ball Z and Super videos. Like that's like his his main channel. So like now I just will find myself of like you know just like random things that you know like uh, just um, you know the story arc of this character, how Paladin scaring ways. Like, so you go down that wormhole. I've yeah. done that too before. And then, and then you'd be like, oh, well, in the in the recommended, there's another <laughs> Dragon Ball from like another guy, uh-huh. and like then he like oh, that guy um you oh, a couple months ago who uh, you posted about uh, he did like a video about Goku's character arc. Yeah, that guy. That guy got some good guy fucking content. Video. Yeah, and like I just find myself just watching his shit, and I'm just like, I should be doing something other than see like guys like that. Again, no slight to their quality, by the way. I purposely will not subscribe to their channel because then I won't have a life. Yeah, because I just watch all their shit and. Um, that's, that's the main thing that fucking YouTube gets me. I go down those wormholes and I start watching all kinds of awesome videos and like some of them are aspiring. Like I'll go, Oh man. But then I always get onto like, well, I want to start making videos. And, and then I'm like, I got to kind of, I can make them for a hobby, but I can't go down that wormhole yeah. because then I'm never going to write again. Yeah, it's, it's too damn much. I need to quit my job. That's what I need yeah. to do. <laughs> if you had, we talk about this all the time. If you had that fucking extra eight hours a day. Yeah. It is tempting to just be like, fuck it, I don't need money. What's don't money? Need it. I'm going to be a bum and I'm going to be a writer and make it happen just be and a so super, much like, shit. Just be a minimalist like, person. Oh, hobo. Hey, they read around to universal income. Dude, I'll fucking live like a bum just to, you know, off $1,000 a month just yeah. to. Well, it's kind of hard with the. Like, how would that even work though, if you have to rent a place? If you own a house, okay, but if you're renting, I don't know too many places. I mean, around here you can get some. But like you live in Pittsburgh, even you're gonna get a place for under like a grand. Yeah. Well, the the whole universe to income thing's it's not just to, to help you, yeah. not to be. But the thing is, like you still have to work, so that doesn't. Yeah. I mean, it probably. I'd imagine it might be like a tax thing where it like varies from like area to area, like you know, like state to state. Who knows? But that's not really what we should be talking about now. If we should be talking about anything. I don't know. We've gone on for like an hour. I don't know if we cut. I think we got some good. Uh, yeah. Publishing talk, at least. I don't know if people are going to take anything away from this, depression-wise. But currently, I'm kind of in just the middle. 
I'm not yeah. like you know down the dumps, but I'm not I'm not up in like the yeah I'm fucking kicking ass. I'm not I'm not there either. Right, Nitro. He's always in a good mood. I like him. Yeah, he's a good guy. Get, wish, get, get, get a good head on his shoulders. Yeah, I wish I was happy like him. If I could just go through life just always happy just because somebody like came in. Yeah. Or like go for a walk makes my whole day. That'd be great. Could you imagine? Oh, I'm just going to go for a walk. Oh, fucking life is beautiful. Raining? I don't give a shit. Yeah, I like it. It's awesome. Uh, all right. Well, if you folks need somebody to talk to, you got your fellow writers at DPW. And you can hit us up on DrunkenPenWriting.com. Hit us up on the old Twitter at, at DrunkenPenWriting. If you want to talk to us on there, we might get back to you. I, tr- I keep up with that more than the Facebook. Yeah. The Facebook doesn't give me the fucking notification, so I always have to look manually. Who got time for that? Yeah. So fuck you, Facebook. The, they did just give us free promotion for five, ten days or some shit. Oh, they so, did? Yeah, it was like a $10 ad or something we could put out, so I did that. I mean, nice. it was like a... They just gave us $10 to yeah. do it. So, we'll see if that comes from anything. I've done the ads before, though. I actually paid for them. And we just got a bunch of people from Mexico. Mm. And, you know, I love my Mexican friends. But, amigos, you're English. Not too bueno. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You guys have a lovely day. See Bye. ya.